Motherhood Incorporated proudly presents Military Mom Talk Radio live on toginet.com. Co-hosted by Robin Boyd and Sandra Beck, the owner of Motherhood Incorporated. Military Mom Talk Radio is here with a powerful platform for women to discuss their ideas, issues, and concerns with respect to the military lifestyle. Military Mom Talk Radio encourages you to share your experiences of being a military wife and mother. This show is dedicated to educating your family about the many resources that are available in both the public and private sector and we'll be sharing helpful information from women all over the world we'll cover everything military from helping a family member cope with post-traumatic stress disorder to navigating government programs dealing with family issues to the struggles of deployment along with being a working mother both in and out of the home this is military mom talk radio and here are your hosts sandra beck and robin boy Hello, everyone. Welcome to Military Mom Talk Radio on this beautiful summer day. I hope it's beautiful in your neck of the woods. We are finally into the warmer weather in New England. I can honestly say we probably should put the snow shovel away, but being in New England, it's always on the back deck. (laughs) One never knows between New England and Buffalo. I think you can always get that snowstorm. We are here today... uh, Uh, Sandra is on uh, a mission. She will be back with us very soon. I am here today to give you a few things that I have found on the on the website and then we're going to welcome Anita Brickman. She's from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and uh, she's got some interesting things to share with us. She has a a story that she wants to share with us of something that's happened recently with their organization and uh, lots of information that we just don't always think about um, when we're uh, in a new phase of life and um, sometimes it's a very difficult one and when you have an organization like Anita's organization to help us process this uh, phase in our lives, it really does make this journey um, a last joy for everyone included. I have a couple of things that uh, I wanted to share with you, first of all, on our Facebook page, and I hope you are uh, following us on Facebook. Just go to Military Mom Talk Radio on Facebook, and you will find us. We had a mention from uh, an organization called Healing for Heroes. Um, they They have a lot of interesting things that they do, but one of the things that they have going right now is a little Kickstarter program, and they are trying to to raise enough money to provide some service dogs for veterans. Um, They have about a 50 if I'm reading this correctly, about a $50,000 challenge that they are trying to achieve. Healing for Heroes uh, wants to bring together shelter dogs and veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or brain traumatic injury, brain traumatic brain injury, excuse me, or other physical or emotional or psychological issues. Now they are trying to do this so there is no charge to the veteran and they are trying to match the veteran to the appropriate dog and have that dog trained by a psychiatric dog trainer. Um, It takes about $5,000 to properly train a dog and have them placed with uh, with their veteran. So if this is something that you are interested in looking into, uh, if you'd like a little more information, you can go to healing, the number of, the number four, healingforheroes.org. Their um, Kickstarter website is www.crowdrise, and that's R-I-S-E, dot com, slash h 4 h Veterans Challenge. And again, it's the number four. So it's H4H Veterans Challenge. Uh, Another thing I wanted to share with you today, um, we uh, always enjoy when Debbie Gregory has some interesting things uh, from Military Connection. I noticed a couple of blogs that she posted and I know we've talked about this a number of times, especially when we've had our um, correspondent Steve Boyd on. She ran a, a, an article recently called um, Veterans at Risk. And what she was um, wanting to make sure that she shared was that veterans who have served Operation Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn, Desert Shield, or she- Desert Storm, 
um, were stationed at Djibouti after September 11, 2001 or served in the Southwest Asian Theater Operation on or after August 2, 1990, that you register with a burn pit registry. Apparently, there had been some very uh, massive burns of, of garbage that included metal, styrofoam, rubber, and medical waste. They wanted to make sure that all veterans are registered with this registry so that if there are any medical complications down the road, the uh, system knows that you were serving in that particular area. Now, the reason why I bring it up is because I know when my husband first went to the VA, he had not been, he was a Vietnam veteran, um, had not been in 40, 50 years uh, to a VA hospital. And when he went, they really recognized where he was, what he had been exposed to, and all of those flags that um, were in his record were definitely bearing on how now his medical history uh, record shows. So if, in fact, there is a problem with his respiratory, if there's a problem um, with a blood issue, if it is at all possible that that could be related to what he had experienced, he has that in his record, and now he can be covered. So it may seem very insignificant, but I can't stress enough for people to say, all right, I need to register with this um, this uh, profile so that I know I can... Um, be well taken care of later if I need to. Uh, another article that Debbie posted was that the Los Angeles mayor, uh, Eric Garcetti, has announced to launch uh, a multi-agency program decide, uh, designed to assist veterans. The LA area is home to approximately 330,000 veterans and he is trying to implement a program so that it will improve the veteran unemployment rate and rise, raise it to um, a, a much higher or a, a reduce it I should say. Um, he's pledging to secure 10,000 jobs for veterans by 2017. So I, if you have not been following that and if this is a demographic that involves you, I do hope you look into that and um, find out more of Mayor Garcetti's initiative. Then there was also uh, something that came in to us through our uh, Facebook page from our pods friends, parents of deployed service members. We want to say congratulations to the volunteers and sponsors in Kansas City who are just about to open the first of three homes to shelter homeless vets. Um, this home uh, is slated to house 58 residents that they're just about to open, and the target is to offer 180 residents a new home. And if you are interested in more information on this, either ways to support this initiative, if this is uh, your neck of the woods, um, or if this, if you have someone in your world that is in need of this kind of service, you might want to contact the Kansas City Catholic Charities or St. Michael's Parish, which is in Kansas City. And we want to thank Tracy from the Pods Group for posting this information and um, giving us the heads up that there's some good things happening out in Kansas City. If you're not a member of Pods, you may want to check them out. They are parents of the Employed service and members. It's a closed group. Our friend Marcella Stretch will get a little tip from you if you try to sign in. She will um, process your request and have you join in with um, their wonderful group. If you have a resource, a question, um, if you need a little guidance, if you need somebody to share a story or hold a hand or a virtual hand, this is the place to go. Parents of deployed service members, a wonderful group. Today, we're going to share some interesting information. We have um, Anita Brickman with us today. She is with the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. She is uh, has been with us before, and what I want to uh, share with you is she is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Communication, and she's the spokesperson for the National Organization, NHP. 
HPCO represents 1,600 hospice and palliative care providers with 3,400 locations across the United States and more than 60,000 individual members. Anita, that sounds like you have a very busy inbox in your email. Welcome to Military Mom (laughs) Talk Radio. (laughs) Robin, it's great to join you, but you're right. We do have members all across the country, so um, it's great to hear from all of them, but it does make for a lot of communication. You're right. (laughs) Uh, We've only got a couple of minutes. I wanted to welcome you first. We've got a couple of minutes before our first break, and um, I just wanted to know first, what brought you to the NHPCO organization? Well, you know, um, I was previously um, a broadcast journalist and for 20 years covering medical news, and this seemed like a great transition in many ways um, to become a spokesperson for such a wonderful organization that is championing, you know, end-of-life care, which is so important to all of us. Um, As much as people don't want to think about it, it is a part of everyone's lives. And personally, my father had um, help from hospice at the end of his life when he was dying of colon cancer, and um, this position has just been a great way to fulfill some, you know, the desire to let people know what hospice really can do, um, especially Mm -hmm. if it's accessed at the appropriate time. And I'm excited after your break to talk to your listeners about what we do in particular with veterans and an incredible vet story that we have on one of our websites right now. It is. uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that later. We want to get to know just exactly what your organization provides, and I also want to uh, check in with you what the difference is between the term hospice and palliative care. Today we're speaking with Anita Brickman. She is with the New the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. She is with us for this this show. We're very, very grateful um, that she's able to join us today. If you would uh, like to tune in to our other broadcast, she has been on with us before, check us out at Military Mom Talk Radio, and you can always find our podcasts there as well as on our show page here on Toganet. We are going to be right back with Anita Brickman shortly right after the break. Are you a military mom looking for help in dealing with the system? Keeping the home fires burning? Well, that's what we're here for. It's Military Mom Talk Radio with Sandra Beck and Robin. And we'll be right back after these. It's not just time for a change, is it? It's much bigger than that. Can you feel it? It's time for a transformation. Will you now imagine that you can and will transform your life? Will you suspend your disbelief and imagine that all things are not just possible, but probable? Imagine that you will meet guides, mentors, and trusted friends who believe in you, hold your hand as they point the way, and teach you to trust your own wisdom. The first of these friends is spiritual girlfriend, Gail Carruthers. Gail will show you how to believe. Believe your perfect divine wisdom will reveal your worthiness. Believe that knowing your power will open your boundless courage. Courage to live consciously, fearlessly, and joyfully. And then know, know all these things are already here and waiting for you to bring them into your divine life. She is here to help you discover, believe, and know. So join Gail. Your spiritual girlfriend every Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. Only here on the Woohoo Radio Network. This is Buzz Local Radio. We have these three topics here, and we just added a fourth because we started talking about hot dogs. <laughs> yes. Yep, in a band. He's in a band. We both had guitars, so I went over to his house Christmas Day that so day. we had to start a band. And uh, I think we wrote four I or five that songs feeling. that afternoon. And Cannibalistic Fish was one of them. Cannibalistic Fish. I couldn't do the dreads. My mom would not oh, let me wear my pants backwards to school either. <laughs> that was wiggity, 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 wack. <laughs> Buzz Local Radio. Available for free download on toginet.com. That's T-O-G-I-N-E-T dot com. 
put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. Hey, Uncle Sam, put your name at the top of his list and a statue of liberty started shaking. Welcome back to Military Mom Talk Radio on toginet.com. Covering topics to help on the home front with help from those who know how the system works and how to work the system. It's more fun than a sale at the BX. Now let's get back to it. It's Military Mom Talk Radio. Here again are your hosts, Sandra Beck and Robin Boyd. Hello, Military Moms. Welcome back to Military Mom Talk Radio. Uh, Sandra's away today, and I know that she's probably out there giggling somewhere because <laughs> when I look at the acronym for our guest's company, it says NHPCO. And, of course, I, being in New Hampshire, want to immediately, immediately say New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> so I am so sorry if I end up stumbling over your company name. I'm going to have to write national all across my notes here. So I'm going to say the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Anita Brickman's with us today. Um, let's talk a little bit about this organization and what it does provide. Um, there is a difference between hospice and palliative care. Oh, there certainly is, Robin, and we're just really trying to get the word out to folks that, well, first of all, to understand exactly what hospice is, um, that it's not necessarily a place, but kind of a team approach to care at the end of life that can be delivered in a person's home, it can mm-hmm. be delivered in an assisted living facility, some hospitals also have wings that are dedicated to hospice, and then hospices also have inpatient facilities. You know, if if a um, patient reaches kind of a critical apex where the family and the patient feel like they need more support in an in- inpatient setting. Um, also, the, for people to understand that there is a Medicare hospice benefit. So it is not something that their families have to really try to um, you know, scrimp to try to include in a health care plan, it is a Medicare benefit. Um, palliative care is further along what we would call up the continuum in the fact that palliative care teams really look at alleviating um, pain and suffering, the idea of palliation, but palliative mm-hmm. care is not just closer to the end of life. Typically, the hospice Medicare benefit is considered to be about six months, and it can be renewed if physicians say, yes, this patient is still um, appropriate for hospice care. Palliative care can come in any time much sooner if you're facing any kind of life-limiting or even chronic illness and symptoms don't seem to be managed. A palliative care team or a consult can help existing physicians Maybe look at the whole patient. What's happening with the family? Could a, um, a, a help from a therapist or someone else ease the symptoms, ease the burden on the family? So palliative care is something relatively new in the way people think about it. But palliative care really is at the heart of what hospice does. It's hmm. just accessible at different times in a person's life. I think everyone hears the word hospice and they think it's an immediate death sentence and therefore they're afraid to face it whereas from what you're saying this kind of support could actually possibly extend that final journey a little bit longer oh there's no question they've actually seen that in particular in with some cancer diagnoses that people actually do better the hope is is that if you are focused on more palliation on more comfort care as Mm -hmm. opposed to very sometimes toxic or, um, you know, difficult to handle treatment, sometimes if a patient is stabilized, they do better. Um, Pain control being such a paramount part of hospice and to be in an at-home setting, hopefully surrounded by family, friends, and loved ones as opposed to in a clinical hospital setting, in fact, people can do very, very well. And that's at the heart of a new consumer website we've launched, momentsoflife.org. The campaign is Moments of Life made possible by hospice to show people unique ways hospice helps bring more moments that are very surprising to people. And everyone in the campaign is all real people. There are no ads. It's all real hospice patients, including a wonderful veteran who is at the heart of a story we released around Memorial Day. It's a beautiful story, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Anita, who decides when it's time to contact services, hospice services? The doctor or the family? 
Yeah, that's a good question. It really, many times, what the, the, the sad thing is that many times patients are waiting for the doctor to bring it up, thinking, okay, well, the doctor's going to tell me really when there's not much more to do, and sometimes that happens. However, physicians may be reticent to bring it up because they don't want their patient or family members to think they're giving up on them. So sometimes mm-hmm. there's a bit of a waiting game. And what we at NHPCO hope to encourage is just a more open dialogue. I mean, you know, if somebody starts doing better while they're on hospice, they can disenroll from hospice. Anybody could ask for a palliative care kind of consult if they feel like their symptoms are not being managed. Sometimes if you have um, individuals, and we have more of this as people get older in America, where you have people with what are called comorbidities. They may have diabetes. They may have heart issues that they're dealing with. Maybe they've had a stroke or, or different things happen. You may have different specialists involved in a patient's care. And sometimes when an illness becomes, you know, really hard, the burden becomes difficult, who's helping look after not just the patient and their symptom control, but the family's ability to cope. Palliative care can come in. We encourage more people to ask this, you know, bring it up with physicians if they feel like, you know, this might be an option for them. Of course, it's hard to talk about. The other aspect okay. is, is that if families have had the discussion earlier on when there's not a crisis, they are more likely to know, okay, we have choices. Is it time for hospice? Which hospice do I want? There's more than one in many communities, and they may want to find out what services are available, you know, what is, you know, what kind of caregiver support is there? All of those things can be asked if you're not, you know, in a crisis situation when you're first looking into that. Yeah. And I guess my question, I've kind of got a twofold question here as we're talking, especially if someone is not of Medicare age, do most insurances cover hospice or palliative care services? They certainly do. They absolutely okay. do. And some private insurers have even gone further, I would say, in trying to push the envelope in what's called concurrent care, meaning in some cases if they feel like a patient really you know, is struggling at a time with an illness, they will continue curative treatment but also allow the patient to get a consult for hospice. Because what they're finding is, okay, so let's say you're not ready completely to to give up on the last chemotherapy or radiation, but if you go ahead and try that and it doesn't look like there's going to be a real gain and um, the treatment is very difficult to take, if a person has already been introduced to hospice, might be enrolled in the hospice uh, benefit, they can more easily make that transition and stay at home than they would otherwise. So some mm-hmm. private insurers actually offer what's called concurrent care. And, yes, even if someone's not of Medicare age but they're deemed appropriate for hospice, they are eligible. And what that typically means is that a physician says if this disease were to take its typical course, that the prognosis would be six months or less. But as we know with some things like um, dementia and Alzheimer's, it is difficult to predict. So sure. we encourage people who are dealing with one of those kind of illnesses to say, hey, maybe we have this discussion as a family. I bring it up to my doctor. You know, it's obviously in the end the patient's choice. Mm. And I suppose, and it's hard to always put emotion aside and have to think about the money, but having that discussion with the doctor will open up the, the ability to have it covered by insurance as opposed to struggling with either nurses, visiting nurses or all of that kind of thing that might not be covered because it might not be a, um, a critical condition. It is. That's exactly right. But the one thing I do need to point out about hospice is sometimes people think, you know, it is something where basically people are staying, you know, at home with family as caregivers and a hospice nurse or a volunteer or an aide mm-hmm may be visiting at different times, but the caregiving aspect is often shouldered by the family. So we don't want to give people this idea that hospice is a substitute for hiring said maybe nursing care. It is something that is um, a benefit where you would have um, a physician, nurses available, but it's not round-the-clock care on behalf of the hospice. And that's one thing you don't want to give pe- uh, consumers, anyone out there, the wrong impression. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got about three minutes before our next break, Anita. Um, is there, uh, so you say that there are a lot of volunteers who p- 
pitch in, I guess, to to provide the care um, to the family. And and I guess we should really point out that a lot of what hospice does provide is not just what the the individual patient needs, but what the entire family needs. Oh, it's so true. And volunteers are a big part of that. Every hospice has volunteers on their staff. It is part of the benefit. And what's interesting is is, um, the respite for the caregiver. We were recently collecting a story in Philadelphia for the Moments of Life website um, with a gentleman who has advanced ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. And, you know, he he is completely, um, he, he, he needs breathing help. He's in a wheelchair. His wife has been caring for him, you know, as this disease has progressed for the last five years. And, you know, she talks about the hospice nurse that comes in and the aides who come in um, you know, for a period of time as, as her saviors because, as she says, if they weren't there, there would be two very sick people in the house. And so the hospice volunteers in particular may offer that respite so that the caregiver, whoever that may be, a, um, an adult child or a spouse, can get out and run some errands or just have some time to just recoup and regenerate. So hospice does not just care for the patient, it's caring for the family as well. And that's where you have this whole dy- team dynamic that comes in. Yeah, and and I, I speak from experience. It certainly is um, the whole family involved. When my dad was very ill, um, mm-hmm. it was the, the ability for my mom to get out and go to just have a cup of coffee with a girlfriend and it's and that gave her the time to enjoy those last months with my dad and um, I think that is so important is that we when we are a family caregiver we get so caught up in the day-to-day I have to remember did she take her meds did he take his meds and so forth and so on that we forget forget to enjoy that person while they're still with us. <laughs> it's so, so true. And caregiving yeah. can be so stressful that you often hear of, um, uh, you know, of older couples in particular where the caregiver, um, you know, sometimes passes soon after the individual they're yeah. caring for because the stress of caregiving, you know, has uh, such a physical burden as well. It's true. We're with Anita Brickman today from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. We'll be back with Anita right after this. Are you a military mom looking for help in dealing with the system? Keeping the home fires burning? Well, that's what we're here for. It's Military Mom Talk Radio with Sandra Beck and Robin Boyd. And we'll be right back after these. Have you heard? The pages of American Patchwork and Quilting magazine come to life on our new weekly online radio show, American Patchwork and Quilting. Join Pat Sloan, our blogging and quilt designer host, as she talks about the latest trends, ideas, and inspirations. Her guests include quilt pattern designers, authors, quilt shop owners, and our editors. All quilters, just like you. Call in with your questions. Get quilting tips from industry experts. Learn about free patterns. Hear behind-the-scenes stories from our magazines, American Patchwork and Quilting, Quilt Sampler, and Quilts and More. Get the scoop on free stuff and find out more about the best independent quilt shops in North America. To listen to a live show, tune in Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Just log on to allpeoplequilt.com slash radio. To hear past shows, go to iTunes and search for American Patchwork and Quilting Radio. We hope you'll join us because we know that quilting changes everything. Have you ever wondered if you're normal or why you feel distant from your partner? Then join us for Sex Talk with Lou with your host, Lou Paget on TogiNet Wednesday nights, 9, 8 central. Do you want to recreate a truly connected relationship or wonder, how do I tell my kids about things? Join Lou Paget, one of the world's best-selling authors in the field of sexuality, a certified sex educator and sought-after expert for all media and her renowned expert guests as they discuss anything and everything about sex that impacts our lives and our families' lives. For more on Lou, check out her website, loupaget.com. 
This is the show where the best experts in the field of sexuality and sexual health can finally give you the answer to that question. Join us for Sex Talk with Lou with your host, Lou Paget, Wednesday nights at 9, 8 central on toginet.com. Because there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. Welcome back to Military Mom Talk Radio on toginet.com. Covering topics to help on the home front with help from those who know how the system works and how to work the system. It's more fun than a sale at the BX. Now let's get back to it. It's Military Mom Talk Radio. Here again are your hosts, Sandra Beck and Robin Boyd. Welcome back, everyone. We're here today on Military Mom Talk Radio with Anita Brickman. She is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Communication, and she is the spokesperson for the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about, Anita, before we go on to um, a different arm of your organization, does... NHPCO provides some educational opportunities for just families, or do you also have educational opportunities for clinicians as well? Well, it's really interesting. Through NHPCO's website, you know, we have our member organizations, and so we definitely provide professional training, webinars, and the like um, to help. We have two major conferences, one that really looks at in the spring with the leadership of hospices and palliative care organizations, and the fall one is called the Clinical Team Conference, and CTC, as we call it for short, is in Nashville this year, and we offer a host of all kinds of um, clinical courses dealing with everything from pediatric hospice or palliative care, um, pain control, um, new modalities um, that are becoming more widespread best practices in the field. So we certainly have resources for clinicians. As far as consumers are concerned, if you are looking for information about that, momentsoflife.org has everything from caregiver resources to what is hospice to um, links to advanced directives if you're wanting to have an advanced planning conversation with your family. So we certainly have resources for families. We have them for clinicians as well. And then there's one aspect that many people don't realize that hospice does. If you've lost someone and you're struggling with grief, hospices across the country offer support groups, even if people were not enrolled in that hospice, even if they, they were not served by that hospice. Um, they have support groups of all kinds for all different ages of people that are facilitated by bereavement specialists. And hospice really has a lot of resources well, as well if you're grieving and trying to deal with that and kind of the normal stages of grief, where to turn for help. So that's another aspect that hospice offers to the community. That's so important. And I guess I brought that question up because I think it's important um, for doctors, nurses to sort of have that extra support to be able to advise patients appropriately in hospice care. Sometimes that's not part of their specialty. (laughs) No, it hasn't. And it's only been in recent years that medical students are starting to be trained in this idea of palliative care that, wait a minute, even if I'm tackling, you know, if I'm fighting cancer cells or trying to keep blood pressure down, am I taking a step back and looking at what that means for the patient? Even if clinically they're doing okay, are they doing Mm -hmm. okay? Is their family doing okay? Are there aspects that we may be missing? Now, obviously, internal medicine specialists are there as well to put all those pieces together. But as as we look at a population that's aging and where that end-of-life trajectory, again, we're not just talking about the last few days or weeks, but are we doing everything to enhance quality of life up to the end of life? And that's where palliative care comes in. And, yes, more doctors and nurses are learning about it. We're actually offering a virtual conference next week. Mm-hmm. Um, about palliative care because it is such a hot topic where people want to understand it better and support their patients better. Mm, how wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about, oh, I guess the one thing before we get there, uh, and I meant to mention, how is your organization funded? 
We are a membership organization, so we are funded by membership dues. We also, through the National Hospice Foundation, um, have um, donations made that support not just our efforts with our organization, but also some of the clinical work that we do. Um, and um, so I, I and um, just in general, some of the charitable work we do both overseas and with our We Honor Veterans program. So we are supported by membership dues and by donation. Mm -hmm. Because obviously a network of this magnitude um, is definitely something that requires uh, some sustenance. So <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, it certainly does. It yeah. certainly does. Yeah. Now we talk, we're starting to talk a little bit, and this is where I would like to kind of steer us to talk a little bit about your We Honor Veterans program uh, or your arm of, and how your organization supports our veterans and their families. Oh, we certainly do. And this is something we are so, so proud of um, in the fact that We Honor Veterans was something created in conjunction with the Veterans Administration to make sure that we are supporting our veterans at the end of life. Hospices do pinning ceremonies. They do um, bedside salutes and so many things to make sure veterans are honored. And they also try to pair up veterans in hospice with volunteers who have veteran experience. It's so important. Mm. There are people who want to give back, and sometimes talking to another person who has seen the battlefield helps a veteran at the end of life be able to, to talk about those aspects of, of, what, um, of you know, what they experienced in a way that they may not be able to share. And then there are other things that We Honor Veterans does. Like I said, the pet pinning ceremonies, um, different kinds of things at the bedside, and also we work very closely with Honor Flight and making sure that some of our veterans in hospice are able to go on Honor Flight even very close to the end of their lives. And there is one story in particular called Dawn's Honor Flight that we have on momentsoflife.org that I challenge anyone to try to get through without ending up in tears because Don's story, even if I've watched it again and again, blows me away in what he was able to accomplish with his son, a last trip to Washington, D.C. from Montana that is just so full of patriotism, love, and honor of country. It's a beautiful story. How did Don come into your, um, into your story? Well, it's interesting. He was helped. He was being served by Rocky Mountain Hospice out in Billings, Montana. He had um, severe COPD and was really worried about. He was approached. He had never been to the World War II Memorial. Wanted to go back with his son, and but it was very concerned about what that would mean as far as his breathing ability mm -hmm. and his hospice. Um, you know, his social worker and therapist said to him, Don, you can do this. He was 86 years old, a veteran of World War II, and again, in the final stages of COPD, but they really made sure his oxygen was at full working order. He and his son made the trip to Washington, D.C., and in the video on momentsoflife.org, you literally see Don going by the, the memorials. You see him at Arlington <sighs> National Cemetery. Yep. You see yep. people, young and old, thanking him for his service. He then returns, and what is so great that Honor Flight does is, you know, they, they gather people there for the return of these veterans to celebrate the sacrifices they've made for this country. And, you know, the man waiting for him just says, Don, you know, you have made it home. You made it. You did it, and he actually passed several hours after that was over, and it is so emotional. But the resonating message is it's twofold. We want mm -hmm. Americans to know that hospice cares about our veterans at the end of life. And number okay. two, we want to show people that you can still enjoy incredible, powerful moments of life up until a few hours before you pass. Now, obviously, not all of us will be able to, none of us can control it, and sure. none of us can, can figure out what our fate or our destiny is, but by making some choices and by having the support system in place for the family that hospice offers, Don was able to have a trip of a lifetime just a few hours before he died. It is an incredible story, and you're right. It's very you got to have a tissue when you sit here and watch it. <laughs> I have to agree with you on that one. Often. <laughs> Absolutely. What about 
when when someone is going to do an excursion of any magnitude, this is a, these trips, the the honor flight trips are big trips. Um, but what if it's even just to go on an outing? Is it really the the doctor's responsibility to say, all right, you're going to need a tank of two tanks of oxygen, you're going to need uh, this, you're going to need that? Where does uh, the hospice may want to help provide that? But what about the medical requirements? And of course, every individual is different. Um, but is there a hand in hand that hospice works with a, a clinical team to make this possible? Well, typically, I would say the most interaction patients will have, by and large, as far as from a clinical aspect with hospice, will be with their nurse. Again, we're looking at at, um, supporting people in their home environment at the end of life. So this Mm -hmm. is not really a a curative aspect that is going on anymore. It's all comfort care, compassion care. But part of that compassion is making sure symptoms are clinically managed and the person is doing okay. And so typically... The nurse could help the family figure out, okay, what's feasible, what's possible. And mm-hmm. also, as an illness progresses, what, what, what can you reasonably do? What can you mm-hmm. expect so that you're not so shocked? Because part of it will be at some point a deterioration. It is the sure. idea that we're easing this transition at the end of life. But when it comes to different excursions on moments of life, what's amazing is you see a father and daughter sharing a dance because he has lung cancer and his pain is enough under control that he can enjoy that with her. A mother is watching her son get married in her own hospice room. You have another story um, with a gentleman named Arthur who died at a hospice in Washington, D.C., and his family brought an opera concert to him. He'd loved opera his entire life, and he's there. He had advanced pancreatic cancer. But he was in a reclining chair, and the hospice team said, you know, how is Arthur doing? Is his pain under control, and, and is, are his symptoms under control? But at the same time, is he lucid enough and able to enjoy this experience with his family and friends? And he was. So it's that delicate balance of saying, we're going to, you know, not over-medicating, yep. Just right, really right. being in tune. What does this patient need? Is it controlled? But the family, the family is a key part of hospice. And, and I can't stress that enough because we don't want people to think, oh, okay, I'm just turning over my house to this team of people who are right, going to take over. Right. No, they are there to support you. But, you know, the hard part, even I know for my mom, was, you know, she was the one, along with my grandfather, who was there the night my dad died. And that experience is not something that's easy for everybody. It's a very difficult one. Anita, we're going to pick this up on the other side of the break. We're with Anita Brickman today. Be back in a moment. Are you a military mom looking for help in dealing with the system? Keeping the home fires burning? Well, that's what we're here for. It's Military Mom Talk Radio with Sandra Beck and Robin Boyd. And we'll be right back after these. Evermore, people have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. These are the words of Dr. Victor Frankel, the inspiration for the movie Victor and I. That's V-I-K-T-O-R and I, movie.com. And Talk Sense Radio, The Meaning Connection, with host Mary Similuka and frequent contributor Alexander Vesley. Friday afternoons at 3, 2 central on toginet.com. More and more people today are discarding their quest for money, possessions, and things, and are instead beginning a serious quest to find meaning in life. Until now, these discussions were historically in the hands of priests, ministers, and scribes, then to philosophers, psychiatrists, and psychologists. Now, these deep discussions are where they should be, in the hands of individuals, on the air, with you. Talk Sense Radio, The Meaning Connection, with your host, Mary Similuka, and frequent contributor, Alexander Vesley. Friday afternoons at 3, 2 central on Toginet.com. It's not just time for a change, is it? It's much bigger than that. Can you feel it? It's time for a transformation. Will you now imagine that you can and will transform your life? Will you suspend your disbelief and imagine that all things are not just possible, but probable? Imagine that you will meet guides, mentors, and trusted friends who believe in you, hold your hand as they point the way, and teach you to trust your own wisdom. 
The first of these friends is spiritual girlfriend Gail Carruthers. Gail will show you how to believe. Believe your perfect divine wisdom will reveal your worthiness. Believe that knowing your power will open your boundless courage. Courage to live consciously, fearlessly, and joyfully. And then know, know all these things are already here and waiting for you to bring them into your divine life. She is here to help you discover, believe, and know. So join Gail, your spiritual girlfriend, every Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. Only here on the Woohoo Radio Network. We'll put a boot in your ass. It's the American way. Hey, Uncle Sam, put your name at the top of his list and a statue. Welcome back to Military Mom Talk Radio on toginet.com. Covering topics to help on the home front with help from those who know how the system works and how to work the system. It's more fun than a sale at the BX. Now let's get back to it. It's Military Mom Talk Radio. Here again are your hosts, Sandra Beck and Robin Boyd. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining us today on Military Mom Talk Radio. If you've missed any of this show or any of our other shows, we encourage you to visit us at militarymomtalkradio.com. You can always find us right here on our host station, Toginet. Dot com, And um, also find us on iTunes. We're there with free, family-friendly pl- programming, all for you. And as you head out on your summer vacation, I hope you take a few podcasts with you so that you can um, enjoy a lot of the wonderful uh, programming that we have had over the last couple of few years. We've been on the air for almost three full years now. So uh, we thank you for that, and we're looking forward to our 200th show at the end of the summer, so do join us for that. Um, today we're with uh, Mil- uh, Anita Brickman. She is from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. I want to give a couple of websites so that people can find a lot more information than what we're covering here. NHPCO, and that's P as in Peter, or palliative, whichever. Um, <laughs> and you want to make sure that it's nhpco.org. You also want to visit momentsoflife.org, and that's moments plural, momentsoflife.org. If you would like to view this um, the story that we are talking about of, of this lovely gentleman, Don, and all of the other stories that are at this particular website. It's a tremendous site, and yep, get your tissues because it's a very moving uh, experience, and I think... You know, I think so many times, and I kind of briefly mentioned this before, we get so wrapped up in the clinical aspect of this part of one's life that we forget to slow down and just stop and enjoy the caring and the person that we are with. I I was very fortunate to have been a caregiver to my mom, um, and she was very mentally astute right until the very last day, uh, but she had some physical challenges. And Mm -hmm. I was very appreciative that we had, we didn't need hospice care, but we had visiting nurse come in. And there was probably a time when we might have not needed it, but I was I made the choice to keep it so that all of my time with mom was not just in the caregiving role but it was in the daughter role and that was so important. But and, and especially like you said Robin you know especially at that time there are so many challenges you're you're facing you know the impending loss of this person that you love how right. do you make sure that you can give yourself the ability to enjoy the time that's left. When you're in constant caregiver mode, when you yourself are exhausted, stressed beyond belief, it's hard to do that. How do you step mm-hmm. back? And that's one of the thing that really, one thing that really resonates in a lot of these stories is that hospice is there to help the family say, wait a minute, let's stop and be in the moment. What kind of legacy does our loved one want to leave? Um, there's a story on momentsoflife.org called Michelle's Angel. Michelle has ALS. She is in a wheelchair in Cleveland um, area. She is in her late 50s. But with the help of hospice, um, some of the aspects, you know, there's a nurse, there's some of 
you know, the clinical aspect, but Michelle uh-huh. also works with a music and art therapist, and people may think, okay, why why is that needed? Well, it's not necessarily like that, the, the, the nuts and bolts needed, but if you are creating an art project with your grandchildren that's a legacy, think about the memory that you're creating. Um, her hospice team helped put together kind of a tea party she could have with the kids so that they stay integrally involved in her life at a time that can be scary for young children. How oh, yeah. is helping them say, you know what, it's okay, there's some sadness ahead, but mm-hmm. what we can tell you is that we're here for your grandmom. We're going to help you enjoy that time with her. They've worked very closely with her husband and her son, who take turns as her caregiver. You can be a better caregiver if you're prepared for what's to come, and you can be a better caregiver if you get a break. Do you help families with final directives? Absolutely. We highly encourage that. And in fact, on NHPCO.org, and we have a link on momentsoflife.org, there are advanced directives. We have them where they've been vetted by the state. We encourage you to have something like this filled out or have the conversation. Sometimes people call it, okay, who speaks for you? Let's say something happens very suddenly and you're incapacitated. Who knows what you really want at the end of life? Do you want to be on a breathing machine? Do you want, you know, feeding help if, if you are in a comatose state? Nobody wants to think about these things. But if you've had a conversation about your wishes at the end of life, how much intervention do you want? If that is written down somewhere, if your family also knows what you want, then there's less debate in the critical situation. It's actually a gift that we have even say, hey, if you're getting together around the holidays, not that every conversation should be about this, but maybe one mm-hmm. should be. What does mom want, especially if we know that there is a, cr- a critical illness that's going to progress? What does mom or dad want? So that the siblings, the, the, the adult children, are in agreement to know what to do. Because there can be dissent. Is it time for hospice? Is it not? Do we want to go full throttle with a, with a search for a cure despite what the odds are? Having some idea of what the adult parent wants or, or your spouse before you get in that situation is crucial. Hmm. Do you find that families look for a durable power of attorney that might not be a family member if there's a large family, just so that there's an objective party looking at this? I think that's more part of the advanced planning conversation and, and you know, and, and when looking at that, we don't really advocate either way about how that should work. What we advocate for is having the conversation and yeah. having some idea of something in writing, um, especially like an advanced directive, because, you know, before you get to that place. What have been, what have, what wishes have been expressed? I know in the mm-hmm. in the um, example of my grandfather on my dad's side, he got very ill very quickly, had a stroke. Uh, my grandmother, who did not uh, who does not speak English very well, was in a panic situation in the hospital. He mm-hmm. ended up getting a lot of intensive invasive treatments that saved his life, but he ended up in a near you know comatose state for a couple years in a nursing home. Now. In hindsight, is that anything anyone would ask for or want? I don't necessarily think so. But she did not know what to say or how to mm-hmm. say it to the doctors in that situation. And, you know, their job, the doc, their job is to save the life. Their job is to do everything possible, you know, unless you tell them that's not what I want. And he was already so debilitated by several strokes. I think she would have said, yeah, you know, make him comfortable, but don't do all of these things. But again, in that situation, once it's unfolding, it's almost like time is completely speeded up and time stands still. I mean, how are you making those decisions under the most extreme stress? If there's something in writing ahead of time, it gives comfort and a, a guidance a tool to everyone involved. So hopefully there is less dissent among children of the parent, which can happen. Oh, yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. I had kind of a cute story. Mom was um, kind of looking over her life insurance and looking over her finances. And we sat and had a cup of coffee one day and we were looking over everything. And this this insurance policy was just about to mature. And she's looking at it all. And so she puts it all down. She goes, Ah, uh, so am I good to go? 
am I good to go? I mean, on so many levels, right, Robin? I mean, there's so many meanings behind that statement. (laughs) That was what she said. She just was like looking at all these figures and she just got a little exasperated. And all she wanted to know was that she was good to go. She had no debt. She had (laughs) all of her bills were paid and she had a life insurance and that was it. Am I good to go? So it was kind of cute. But I I also think that people want to have, you know, sometimes you know, our, our, like our, I remember my grandmother really wanting to talk about what she wanted at her funeral and stuff. And, you know, sometimes families have a tendency to be like, Oh, grandma, why are you doing that? Why are you thinking about that? And instead of discouraging the talk about end of life and death, you know, part mm-hmm. of what NHPCO wants to do is say, Hey, we talk about all aspects. You know, a lot of the bereavement camps, that are focused at kids, one of them in particular that we have a story coming out this summer on, their motto is, life is hello, life is goodbye. Now, if we completely avoid the goodbye, what what service are we doing ourselves? If we shut down conversations where our aging loved ones want to talk about what they want at the end of life, the way they want to be remembered, you're cutting off a conversation that helps you as the loved one left behind and that allows that person to wrap up unfinished business, so to speak. So we want those conversations to happen instead of families just being like, oh, let's not talk about that. Or even worse, in some cases, after someone dies, not to deal with the loss and allow children and others to talk about how sad everything really is, because part of the, the recovery from grief is talking about it. Very much so. We've only got a couple of minutes, Anita, and I'm, this hour flew by. Where can we find out how to volunteer, how to get support, how to um, do more? Well, basically, I would, I would put people to two very clear places, momentsoflife.org, which is the consumer focused website that we have created at NHPCO, momentsoflife.org, has caregiving resources. It tells you what hospice is and palliative care. It has a way to get involved so that you can say, hey, how do I volunteer at a hospice if I want to do that? Mm -hmm. The other website we have is caringconnections.org caringconnections.org. It has a lot more in-depth material if you are trying to, you know, help someone who's grieving. If you want a specific advanced directive from your state, it's all free and on caringconnections.org as well. So NHPCO really wants to, to help spark a national conversation about this, and we hope that the beautiful stories on momentsoflife.org draw people in, but we hope they spend some time at the website once they're there and get past the emotion and say, okay, what do I want for me, and how do I find out about my options and my choices? Hospice is a choice, and you have a choice among hospices, but this it's is an beautiful. idea of saying, if you talk about it sooner, if you look ahead, you will have more choices to make. Anita Berkman, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it so much. Uh, Next week, I'd love to have everybody come. Uh, Stephen Boyd, our roving reporter, will be here. Uh, I want to leave everybody with a Sanskrit proverb. Look to this day, for yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived. Make every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day.